before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful well done to the on farm podcast guys 150 episodes that takes some doing keep up the good work Say a big congratulations to On Farm for reaching your 150th episode. Um, she's been great working with you on our many projects in the past. Thank you. Hi, Carol from Gillespie McAndrew here. Congratulations to On Farm Podcast on their 150th podcast. Look forward to doing another one with them perhaps uh, after the successful Five Show podcast. Helen Glass from SOS. Uh, well done. Um, seen and heard on your 150th um, On Farm podcast. Hi, Katrina Barkley from Rhett here, wishing you all the best on your 150th episode On Farm. Thank you very much for all the support you've given us over the time and it's a delight to be able to celebrate with you and wish you all the best. Hi, I'm Lucy Laidlaw from Lucy Laidlaw Communication and I wanted to say a huge congratulations to the team at On Farm Podcast for their 150th episode. I've been lucky enough to be interviewed by the team and I can't say how pleasurable it was. It's basically like having a natter with a good friend, but the added bonus is that they're as passionate about the topic as you are. Um, Listening to the On Farm Podcast has been a great way of uniting the rural community and I have to say it is one of my go-to listening materials in the car on long journeys apart from the episode I was on I definitely didn't listen to that one congrats again on an amazing effort and I can't wait for the next 150 well there you go this is our 150th episode we've reached a milestone we've reached an unbelievable milestone because I am led to believe that not many podcasts make it past 10 Six, five, however many. We've got to 150. And it was so nice to hear those words. We heard from Cami from the Sheep Game right at the start and others, guests who we've had on in previous episodes and just friends of the pod. And it was lovely. Um, I'm so proud to hear all of that. It's amazing. Um, So this is our 150th and I've got Dave with me. Hello, Dave. Hello, Monty. That really was great, wasn't it? Thanks to all those people for indulging us, letting us have those words. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, something a bit different for this episode. Because it's 150th, to mark the occasion, we've teamed up with Bell Ingram. We've got Eleanor and Alison with us from the Bell Ingram team. Hello, Monty. We were very pleased when you invited us onto the Bell Ingram stand at the Highland Show. And if you recall, we had a brilliant day. We challenged people to come along and pitch a podcast to us. Tell us about what topics, stories, what was happening in their um, charity, their organisation, etc., Anything that they thought we should do a future podcast on. So, today's episode is all about that challenge. We've got a selection of the ideas that came to us on the day. And the three of us, and Dave, are going to go through them, listen to them all now, chat about them, and decide which of the ideas, if any, are going to make it as a Bellingham-supported future podcast. Does that all make sense to everyone? That all makes perfect sense. Hopefully it makes sense to the listeners as well. So, we're going to hear each idea in turn, just as it was pitched to us on the Saturday at the Highland Show. And then, we're going to make a decision at the end of this episode. Producer Dave, you are the man with the buttons. You're going to play in the interviews, the pod pitches, the picture pods. Tell us, who are we going to hear from first? So, we've got seven people that we've heard from all together. There's a really brilliant variety of things here. I think we're going to have a tough time selecting the kind of best ones we might want to follow up, but... I thought we'd start 
with a couple of centenary celebrations. So we had two people come and speak to us at the Highland Show at the Bellingham Stand, both wanting to sort of sell us 100 years, 100 years of the important thing that they're interested in, an important kind of society in Scottish farming. Now, we can hear those two chats side by side and maybe check in afterwards to see what we think of them both. Here's the first one. My name's Claire. I think you should do the Highland Pony Society reaching 100 years. It's centenary year. It's a massive excitement in the amongst the breeders. and. Um, yes, they um, did a lovely display in the main ring last night. That's great because the centenary and, and, and that display, and if we were to make a podcast for you, it's all about raising the profile of the breed. Because I understand, I mean, we all think of Highland Ponies as being sort of ubiquitous we know people that breed highland ponies or whatever but actually there's there's not enough of them is there they're no, they are on the rare breed list so um it's good to get all the more information out about them and as a very versatile breed they are good for everything i think this is a great idea so claire thank you very much for pitching a podcast to us not a problem so there you go that was our first centenary that was claire pitching 100 years of the highland pony society certainly a, a worthy thing to include and, and a, a brilliant subject matter but here's the other 100 year celebration that was pitched to us my name's john forbes and i'm the caithness district young farmers chairman 100 years ago this year the first young farmers club in scotland was formed in a wee place called lanargal in caithness it was formed by three individuals that got together their influence they'd seen it similar things happening in England and America and they thought this would be a good idea for young people to do in Scotland. How does it feel to be a hundred years down the line with them? Because actually you're the chairman in the centenary year that must be quite special. Yeah it is special yeah it's amazing to see what the whole organisation has come to from a small thing in Caithness it started off with a, a pig fattening competition uh-huh. Tell us again. A pig fattening competition. <laughs> fattening. Pig fattening competition. Pig competition. <laughs> right. So a pig fattening competition. So what? They were each given a pig and then told to go off and see who had the best pig at the end of it? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It was recorded what they had fed the pigs and how much profit or loss they had made out of them. They also, like right from the very start, they were doing stock judgings and, and stuff. So it's, it's, it's amazing to see that that's actually still taking place. It's amazing to come to the Highland Show, especially on the Saturday when you've got your national stockmanship competition, the tug of war finals, etc. It's a massive day for you guys, representing a massive organisation. You must be so proud that it started in Caithness. Absolutely. So, how are you celebrating the centenary, John? We've got a few events throughout the year. We hosted a tractor run at Christmas time, we held a, a quiz in a local hall. So, John pitch a pod to us. I think this is a great story. I think it's it's really, really interesting to hear where what we now know as SAYFC has come from. There's a commemorative stone going in, I understand. That's correct. That's correct. We're uh, erecting a commemorative stone at Lanargal School, which was the site of the very the first... exact spot. The exact spot of the okay. first uh, club. So we'll be having a kind of opening ceremony for this, for this stone. Maybe that's the day we should I turn think, up. I <laughs> think that would be a really good exercise for us, actually. I think I could see us going up there to see the unveiling of the stone. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was great to hear from those two centenarians. And how appropriate would it be as we celebrate our big anniversary here at On Farm? I just must apologise to, to John Forbes because... I did um, pick up the pig fattening competition as pig fettling competition. It's much easier to listen to in my earphones as it was on the very busy, noisy Bell Ingram stand at the show. What do you guys think? Eleanor, Alison, Dave, what do you reckon to what we've heard? Oh, it would tie in very well with your 150th episode, wouldn't you? They're both very worthy pitches. I have to say I've got a bit of a soft spot for the young farmers, though. We've got quite a lot of young farmers at work, and it's a great organisation. It covers the whole of Scotland. But then again, I saw the Highland Ponies, because we were right in the main ring at the show as well. And, yeah, this is a difficult one. What about you, Eleanor? I love John from Caithness Young Farmers. I think they've got a great story to tell. And who knew? Well, I certainly didn't, that the first club was in Caithness. I know. Yeah, it's interesting, because... A lot of organisations, for whatever reason, seem to start off 
in the south and spread north, as it were, don't they? But that was interesting, you know, to start off in Caithness and with with roots in America, etc. I I I agree. I mean, having come through Young Farmers myself, I, I agree that could be a really worthy, um, a really worthy one. Did any of you guys see the 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 Highland Pony um, Tam O'Shanter display in the main ring outside your stand on what, what I think was on the Friday night? Or were we all closed up and home by then? I think we might have been closed up and home, but I think we saw them going into the ring. Uh, again, always really impressive. The ponies for me were a real standout of the show this mm-hmm. year. I really enjoyed them. We actually spoke to Sylvia Ormiston, the president of the Highland Pony Society, in our Highland Show Roundup episode. I think she's such an impressive person. And, and does a great job of kind of flying the flag for the Highland Pony Society. Yeah, and and Sylvia and her husband won the the is it the William Young Award? Very is that right? The Sir William Young Award, award. which is for exceptional um, stockmanship. They were the the, the recipients um, of that award from from RAS this year. So, you know, a lot going on in the in the in the Highland Pony world. But yeah, we've got two contenders there. Dave, where do we go next? Well, we met a very enthusiastic and passionate young 11-year-old from Dumfries and Galloway called Cara, uh, and she's very passionate about her local agricultural show. So next, I thought we should just hear from Cara with her pitch. My name's Cara, I'm 11 years old, and I'm from Shinar, Scotland. My idea is for a Shinar agricultural show. The show is held on the last Wednesday of July every year, it's a big dairy cattle show, is that right? Yeah, it's so one that's of maybe what it's a bit more unusual than some of the shows, is yeah, that? It's yeah, like one of the biggest ones in Scotland, I think. Biggest ones in Scotland for dairy cattle. Yeah, that could be interesting for us. Yeah, there's lots of entertainment, including Paul Hannon's motorbike stunt display team and cow leading and showing. What do you do? Are you personally involved at the show? I'm usually leading a calf. All right. Showing it around in the arena and just basically like a young handlers and a lot of different classes. It depends on the type of calf or cow it is. Do you enjoy doing that? Um, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. If it's a good day and the sun's shining and you're doing well and the calf's yeah. behaving. Right. So, Cara, why should we come to the show at Strumra? What's on offer there? So, there's beef cattle, sheep, um, sheep haircuts sometimes. There is um, music and entertainment with horses as well for working hunter, I think. And there's lots of food stalls and stuff. You have me at the food. I think I think it's a great idea because I think, you know, on farm, we like to get out and go to shows. Um, Dave was at the Five show. We are at the Highland show. Um, and we like to hear about some of the more local events that are happening as well. And I particularly like the fact that the Stranraer one sounds like, you know, we've seen a lot of beef cattle, etc. here today, but I particularly like the fact that Stranraer sounds like it's a dairy cattle. Yeah? yeah, a lot of dairy cattle. That could be really cool. Thank you. What was the date again? So in case people listening want to just get their tickets? It Wednesday, 26th of July. Wednesday, the 26th of oh. July. London oh, Road playing field in Stranraer. A Wednesday? Means oh, we can do Wednesday, it. that could be classed as a working day. We can day call day. it work. We can call it work. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Cara. You've pitched a pod to us. That one's on the list. Cara, yeah, thank you. Well done. Aha. Road trip. Stranraer. Shall we all just head down together, the four of us? What's the plan? <laughs> I think that sounds good. I've never been to the Stranraer show. And didn't Cara do a brilliant job of selling it to us as oh, well? Oh, what a great ambassador for the show and the region. 11 years old, coming onto the stand and pitching that pod. I brilliant know. job. She's very grown up. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Excellent job. You know, for that reason alone, that should be worthy of consideration. Um, never mind the fact that actually Stranraer show sounds awesome. There was something about motorbike stunt display team, which, yeah, we've never had that on the pod yet either. I like the sound of the sheep haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> golden shears, Dave, haircuts, yeah, don't know. Um, probably should drop that one in here again. Um, this is our 150th episode. Dave actually reckons that our best ever episode was was two two back, which was about the golden shears. So um, if you're into sheep haircuts, maybe we'll go to Stranraer show, but maybe you could listen to the golden shears episode too. Alison, Eleanor, are we ready to move on? We yes. are. 
cool. So it all got a bit sciencey at one point in the afternoon as we were asking people to pitch their pods to us because we spoke to the team from uh, the Rowett Institute. Uh, and we said, look, have you got any good stories? Have you got anything that we ought to be covering on the On Farm podcast? And sure enough, they certainly did. So we're going to hear a couple of quite sciencey pitches now. People that were involved in cutting edge research also, like Cara was, hugely enthusiastic about what they do uh, and about thinking about food and farming and particularly sustainability. So we met the Rowett team as we were walking along through the, the, through the show we, we said to them, have you got um, any stories that you'd like us to, to cover for the podcast? And if so, come down to the Bale Ingram stand. Well, so enthusiastic were they that they basically chased us down the aisle and into the Bale Ingram stand before we were even back at it. So that's how enthusiastic they were about pitching their pod. And yeah, let's let's hear what they had to say. I'm Annika Vaki and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Aberdeen and the Rowett Institute. So we focus on health and nutrition. And my focus in my PhD is vertical farming. I'm working with the James Hutton Institute as well and IGS, Intelligent Growth Solutions. So they're the company that develops this technology. All of this is patented all around how to build your vertical farm. It's essentially a part of controlled environmental agriculture. It's all indoors. So you make the weather inside this farm rather than outside. So you don't rely on the outside weather conditions. So we can make- That sounds good. (laughs) The rain, we can make the sun, we can make the wind, control the temperature, humidity, everything. So it's perfect, so we can grow stuff in Scotland that we could never normally grow, which is a high advancement, I think. It's supposed to add on to the agriculture we already have in Scotland, so it's not supposed to replace anything. We still want our tatties and our kale and everything to be grown outside, but we want to grow things like strawberries, tomatoes, that we would have to rely on imports for so much research is being done into the LEDs as well because that's the main source of the carbon footprint of vertical farming because it uses so much electricity. Scotland wants to be net zero so the goal is to have completely renewable energy especially investing in hydrogen as well and if we have that as a source then it would be completely carbon neutral and the land use and water use of vertical farming is so much lower if you're comparing greenhouse especially from Spain things like that to the one in Scotland and vertical farming it's so much lower the water footprint the land footprint you free up all this land as well to, for reforestation or to grow other things, to grow crops for other kind of food as well, which is brilliant. Yeah. So why would a podcast about vertical farming be a good idea? I think just to spread awareness, because that's the main issue that we have with this. That's what my research is trying to focus on as well, how to bring it to Scottish consumers so people actually know what it's like and that's not dangerous. You don't have to be concerned about things coming out from indoors because it's actually the nutritional value is the same. There's nothing wrong with it. It's hydroponically grown, but also the nutrient solution. It's got the same stuff in it as soil does. So you can, it's just as good for you. So if we were to choose to come and, and see this, what would we see? What, what does it look like? What does a vertical farm look like? So the towers, they're either six, nine or 12 meters high and it's stacked layers of plants growing on top of each other, about the size of a snooker table for one of the, one of them. And then you have lots of different crops in there. You've got lots of salads, herbs, things like that. And the LED lights, so it's kind of pinkish blue inside. It's amazing. It's really cool. That's sounds cool. Brilliant. That sounds brilliant, Dave, doesn't it? I think that you've pitched a pod to us. There you are. That's Annika, very passionate about vertical farming. Huge thanks to her. And I'll just introduce the next one as well, because it's, you know, along similar veins. This is our first joint pitch Again, from people involved in research at the Rower Institute, Catherine and Amelie. I'm Annalie Lofsted and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Aberdeen at the Rowett Institute. I'm Catherine Baungard and I'm a PhD candidate also at the University of Aberdeen and the Rowett Institute. Both of us work on seafood. Well, I think the first one is thinking about seafood in the diet. I think they're a brilliant source. Of, well, first of all, they're very nutritious. They offer a brilliant source of omega-3 and vitamin D, but also various micronutrients. They are sustainable a lot of the time compared to land-based proteins. If we think about the carbon footprint, and a lot of the time, I'd argue they're probably more affordable, especially I do appreciate that sometimes the prices can vary. So in the UK, you might have heard of the big five, which is the five species that we consume in the UK, and that is cod, haddock, salmon, tuna, and prawns. And so we're really interested in helping people to look at how do you consume, for example, mackerel, or sardines, or anchovies, or even mussels, which is a, another great source. Really interested in the fact that 
you talk about like mackerel, that would have at one point been a kind of mainstay of the Scottish diet, but now it's maybe fallen off a bit, is that? Uh, mackerel but herring as well in Scotland they had something called the herring girls where women from all over Scotland would come and they would gut the fish and it was just an incredible show of you know, strength and, and effort that these women had, mm-hmm. and yeah. So, so, so where I live, just outside Lauder in the borders, there's something called the Herring Road, which comes all the way across the Lammer Muirs from Dunbar on the coast, and it must be 25 miles across the hills, and that's where the herring used to be brought from the coast inland. Yeah. It was a cheap source of foodstuff, cheap source of protein for the land, yeah. in you know, away from the coast, and they would cart it on baskets. Yeah. So it, you know, it's, it's historic as much as it is looking to the future of a protein source, yeah. I would suggest, I would invite you up to Aberdeen. Well, first of all, we've got Peterhead and Fraserburgh, which are the uh, biggest... Uh, it's a big centre of the, the herring and fishing. Yeah, yeah. 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 And wild fish as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, of course, we have Fitty as well down at Aberdeen Beach, which yeah. is uh, where the herring girls used to live and the families. Um, there's a big history about it in the Aber- Aberdeen Maritime Museum as well. Yeah. And then, of course, we would bring you over to the Rowett and basically talk to you about the work that we're doing in terms of mapping the seafood supply chain, yeah. but then also thinking about how we can perhaps make uh, more sustainable choices when it comes to protein in our diet. I think one last thing to add is one of the only seafood canneries or tinneries in the UK is based in Peterhead so that could also be an interesting place to go because like like we want to say is uh, canned tin seafood is a really great and cheap option as another protein alternative so <laughs> a general look at the seafood industry in Scotland who eats it where they eat it why they should eat more like the, we enjoy talking about it <laughs> well done. if you want to try some canned fish though yeah very welcome to pop by yeah. Do you know what? These were really good, strong contenders because, especially on the vertical farming side of things, I could really see myself learning a lot and hopefully the listeners learning a lot too. It's such a fascinating subject. Annika comes across really well in terms of explaining that it's not about, it's not replacing Scottish farming. It would sit alongside what we already do in, in Scotland in terms of even things like strawberries, etc. Because what it would be about is making sure that we can grow these things all year round rather than importing them. So I think that, for that reason alone, would be worthy of a podcast and, and worth exploring. Yeah, I would agree with that as well, Monty. She was really enthusiastic and she could explain it in a really clear and concise way, particularly comparing it to the pool tables or the snooker tables piled one on top of the other. Yeah. Really liked her. I think as well, there was a real buzz about vertical farming at the show, wasn't yeah. there? So it's obviously a hot topic. Yeah, it's a hot topic. A lot of people, I think, went along to a business breakfast and there was quite a lot of, um, I think one of the speakers was talking about vertical farming. Not sure if it was Annika, but yeah, it's. I heard a lot of people talking about it. And anything to reduce food miles is a good thing. Absolutely. The other one was a bit... Um Slightly kind of left field, we tend to we, we tend to do a lot of agricultural, we tend to do a lot of um, farm-based things on the On Farm podcast, but of course On Farm is food, agriculture and rural matters, so food, so seafood. So, you know, canned seafood um, as a, an underutilised um, food source in Scotland, um, that was something that, you know, was, was completely different for me and and again i think could make a really interesting podcast you could do a whole series on scotland's relationship with fish (laughs) and seafood because we it wasn't necessarily all in that edit but we talked a lot about the history and heritage of like the the herring girls and the and the herring roots across scotland as well and how that was a really integral piece of the sort of economy in places like peterhead and and all sorts of other coastal places around scotland you know there's a whole (laughs) you could do six episodes on on that stuff and and they were so enthusiastic about it as well yeah when you're talking about the history you're talking about the herring industry and then how it compares to the way that we farm fish now particularly you know the huge operations um in the north of the country and in the west and in the um in shetland as well yeah fascinating so look that's the two offers brilliant offers from the rower institute and their various partners are you guys ready to hear the next one i think this is a really this one will Definitely be a contender that we're going to play in next. Monty, you've got a soft spot for this one, I know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I know what's coming next, Dave. Go for it. My name is James Arnett. I farm at Mains of Cool at Forfar. Pickups for Peace is a farmer-led initiative. 
it is a, now a registered charity, so any money that is donated gets gifted. And what happens is they take pickups from anywhere, everywhere, as long as they're MOT'd, we then drive them from wherever in Scotland, wherever in England, Wales, Ireland, to Ukraine, where they are then used for taking supplies, food, etc., to the front line. And the convoy that's going out next, it will be going to the area where the dam has burst, taking supplies and food out there and then it is used by the military for transporting backwards and forwards. That's 140 pickups that have gone out since uh, February when the first P4P number one convoy went out and every pickup is full to the gunnels with aid, whether it's spades, chainsaws, generators, ratchet straps, cable ties, water bottles, jerry cans, etc. You guys are heroes doing that. You're heroes gathering up these no, vehicles. You're doing it. We're farmers. But, <laughs> but I guess that's where I'm getting to. You're heroes because as a farmer myself, I'm just so grateful for you that are Aye. taking the time to do it and, mm -hmm. and rep represent us, if that's the way to put Aye. it. So yeah. well done. Thank you. So thanks to James Arnott for bringing pickups for peace to our attention. Monty, Eleanor, Alison, that's a really strong pitch, right? It's such a strong pitch, Dave, that... Unless anyone else disagrees, we're going to do that. We're going to do that anyway. We are going to make a podcast about pickups for peace. Now, I mean that as being that's not part of this competition anymore. The The rest of the pitches we hear are still in the running. That's your pitch -a pod Pickups for peace. We're making a pod for you. That's how strongly I feel about what the guys are doing out there. So, so just to be clear, having heard that pitch, we're now taking Pickups for Peace out of the competition to say that we're definitely going to make a podcast about them and the work that they do. And all of the others we're considering are still in the running for the Bellingham On Farm Pitcher Pod episode. Yes, Dave. The listeners might hear my thumbs up emoji here because I think that that's exactly what I mean. What I propose is there's a Pickups for Peace podcast going to be made and I'm going to make sure that we support it and we get Bellingham and Gillespie McAndrew and all of our sponsors on board because I think that that is such a worthy podcast regardless of the other pitches that's going to happen. Well, the competition just got interesting. It certainly did. Uh -huh. I suppose it's your, your podcast, yeah. Monty. You can change the rules if you want to, right? <laughs> no, that's not how it rolls. It's not my podcast. It's it's the On Farm podcast. It's everyone's podcast. I tell you what, just as well Anna's not here. I may be getting right, shot she might by tell now. You. All right, listen. So we've got all of the ones we've heard so far. We've got pickups for peace that we're definitely doing anyway. Uh, there's one. More. Oh, go on. I've just remembered. I've just remembered. That was my golden buzzer. There golden buzzer. Pickups that, for peace okay. is my golden so, buzzer. Just so that the audience right. don't think we're making this up as we go along. Monty's now got a golden buzzer, everybody. Have we all got a golden <laughs> buzzer? Or is it just Monty who's got a golden buzzer? Just, just Monty. me. Just we're, me. We seem to be missing one. We think, <laughs> yes, we should have a golden buzzer. <laughs> we might need to think this through a bit more fully for next time. But I, I think in some ways I've saved the best for last in terms of these pitches. Because the one that we're about to hear is it's not a golden buzzer, but it's a wild card. And let me tell you, this pitch takes us on a journey from quite a well-known Perthshire eatery to Ryland Clark, the TV show Taskmaster, to Hollywood and back again, all via life-size plastic cows, the kind that you might be familiar with if you've ever attended an event put on by RET, the Royal Highland Education Trust. Hi, uh, my name's Kenny Farkson and I've got the Horn, Horn Milk Bar, which has become somewhat, somewhat iconic over the years. Uh, about 20 years, I, I would go into business, been there all my life. Mum and Dad would start off as a, as a little farm shed, farm shop, as it were. In my thought process, I decided to put a, a life-size model cow on top of the roof of the restaurant. Possibly for three reasons, to become iconic for marketing purposes and to have something associated with the horn, because it was obviously based, the business was based on um, products of milk, or derivatives of milk, so it would be set up as, as, when we had a dairy farm, we set up to sell milk, ice cream, my mother would do the home baking of scones, um, cakes, etc. So the cow would be put on the roof. The cow has possibly worked very, very well for us. There's various things that have come on the back of that, but 
as well as the horn, we now have a, a business that supplies life-size model animals around the world. So at the moment, if you go on television, you will see one of our cows on Channel 4's Taskmaster. Rylan Clark, who's the personality of the television, um, named the cow Linda after his mum. The main cow that we supply is a milking cow, so we bring the cows in as standard models and then someone might want to customise or someone might want to milk as well, so we can actually physically milk the cows. These cows are converted and put out basically all over the world, so we've got cows in Australia, we've got cows in Pleasanton, California, which is twinned with Blair Gowrie. And because the horn is, is very iconic and very retro and it looks like an American diner, we then, were pre, pre, pre-COVID, we were approached by a film company to come in and use as, as a location. So subsequently, in the last two years, we have been used as a film location for six movies, six movies, including Disney. So we're currently on the Disney Channel, we're on Disney Plus at the moment in the wedding season, episode three. The horn features in one of the episodes quite highly. Last year we were used for two music videos. So we're actually currently on, on YouTube. If you look up Auto Heart and a tune called Time Machine, we are featured in there as well. And on the back of that, what happens is that we've got, we've got three kids. The youngest one, Gabriella, is into acting and drama. So she features in five movies and two pop videos on her CV at the age of 16. So it looks pretty good. So the only problem is, of course, she complains to her dad that she's become typecast as a waitress. As a waitress in a, in a milk bar. In a milk in a, bar, Or yeah. an American diner. We have met listeners we've met the man behind milking mabel so milky mabel we were one of the first original she was the original milking cow she's one of nine that Rhett have and the idea obviously as you know monty from from Rhett is what they do is they they, they, they get a hold of retired uh, farmers and farmers wives who go out onto onto farms and educate children and the general public about maybe the story of milk or certainly educate them about agriculture which we're big on i'm a, a great believer that people should learn about it and also tying up probably using the you know, tying them urban and, and, and rural because, you know, they don't understand. Children that go into urban schools these days don't understand where milk comes from. They think it comes from a bottle or a carton. Whereas if you actually you, you turn up with a life-size model cow, which looks like a real cow, they're actually surprised with the scale and they're surprised with actually where, where the story of milk comes from. I think we've been pitched a pod about milking Mabel. And the o- no, the, <laughs> the origins of milking Mabel. I would love to know, and Rhett might have some figures on this, you could add up over the years, how many children have learnt about milk and where milk comes from and connected with the countryside through those cows. We've just, we've just, you know, that's the origins. One of my friends, uh, it was our 21st, so we took the, down the borders actually, uh, we took the cow down and it was filled with Prosecco and you could fill up your glass from the cow. So there wasn't a bar, the bar actually was the cow, so the cow sat up in a plinth at the side of this hall and they milked the cow from the side, it's full of 50, 50 litres, the, the tank inside holds 50 litres and it had 50 litres of Prosecco inside the cow. <laughs> so. Many uses, many, many uses. Yeah. Right, we're on the Bell Ingram stand, maybe we could inspire them to do that for next year. <laughs> wouldn't that be great for the pims, wouldn't it? I just want, before we discuss that, I just want us to take a moment to recap this moment. My name's Kenny Farkson and I've got the horn. Oh, <laughs> Kenny. I know, he's... What an opener. It is, what an opener and what a story. He must have done um, it on purpose. It, of course he did. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> but you're right, what a story. Where would you even start with it? Bring it back to earth. I think the star of that show, if we cut through all of that, the star of a pod would be Milking Mabel. I'm I I Kenny. What he's such a character, isn't he? He's such an ambassador in the Perthshire farming community. He does the Perth show as well. He's a well Kent face, and his cows are just spectacular. We're actually thinking of getting a Bell Ingram cow at some point. Yeah, but I know <laughs> what Monty's saying about milking Mabel. There's got all the educational credentials. I think that would be the way the podcast would have to go. Otherwise. A lovely story, though, it is it's a little bit of an ad feature for Kenny's Milk Bar <laughs> and his plastic <laughs> cow business. But I tell you what I do think, and this is, I guess, my, if that, my, my reason for maybe not doing a podcast about Kenny's story. And that is that I think he's basically already told us the whole story. What, what else would we want to go and hear about <laughs> that we haven't already just heard from Kenny in his pitch? Oh, I'm sure he's got some stories. He probably has some stories, but you're right. It's kind of an elevator pitch. He covered everything. He's done it. Um, he's done it. What else is there to ask he, him? He's, he's, be, he's been there and got the horn. Yes, um, been there and got the horn. We need to kind of 
get into final decision making time. So, well, I do the kind of um, quick reminder. Who? What was that? That was uh, Stella Black, wasn't it? Here's our Dave with a quick reminder. Um, <laughs> Dave. Yeah. So we had Kenny the Horn. We've got pickups for peace, and Monty's already unilaterally decided we're doing a podcast about them. Yeah, so we can buzzer. we can kind of count count them out. We had Catherine and Amelie from the Rower Institute on seafood awareness. Also from the Rower Institute, or connected with the Rower Institute, we had Annika uh, on vertical farming. Before that, we had brilliant 11-year-old Cara telling us why Stranra's show is very important and should feature. And before that, we had our two centenaries, the 100 Years of the Highland Pony Society from Clare, and John, John was the chairman of Caithness Young Farmers and wanted to pitch to us the centenary of the Young Farmers movement in Scotland, which is essentially what that was. It was the very first Young Farmers club in Scotland set up in Caithness 100 years ago. That's a really strong field. I do not envy you guys having to make a decision out of those six potential podcasts. I think for me, it's got to be the Caithness Young Farmers I think anything that promotes the young farmers is a great thing. They do so much within our sector and I've got such a soft spot for them anyway because we have so many young farmers at work. So that would be my vote. They are really strong contenders. I really like the Milking Mabel idea. I really like, you know, that to me is a, is a game changer in terms of before Milking Mabel. How did children learn where their milk came from? That would be my one of mine in the running. Um, 100 years anniversaries of the Highland Pony Society. I think for me, I would be looking to the future. If we were going to do a podcast about that, it would be how do we help that breed kind of move forward and, and, and get more people involved. And I'd love to do that. But maybe, 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 You've maybe. You've got to pick um, one, Monty. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I tell you what, I'd rather hear what Eleanor has to say before I before I show my cards. <laughs> I think you've already shown it. It's a really difficult decision to pick between these really worthy causes, but it's great to see so much charity and innovation on the go in the farming world. Absolutely. Really impressive. But I think for me... I want to hear more about the vertical farming. I think it's a huge advancement in the sector and we all need to know more about it. Okay. Mm. So vertical mm. farming gets my vote. Oh, we've mm. all gone for something different. Well, I didn't really reveal my card though, did I? I sort of hedged oh. my bets. Dave, do you have an opinion on this? Oh, well, I, I was thinking about it beforehand and I <laughs> this is a total cop-out. I had a short list of three that I was keen on and that I just think would be fabulous. And one was pickups for peace. Seems a no-brainer. You're right to do your totally made-up golden buzzer on that. I also, like Eleanor, am really fascinated by vertical farming. I think it could be a real game-changer. And as you said, Monty, Annika did a brilliant job of pitching it as something separate from you know traditional farming and, and an additional thing rather than something that might be a threat or might be swallowing up Scottish farming. But the one, if I had to pick one, I would pick the centenary of Caithness YFC just because I think it's really fascinating how that is kind of, you know, that pebble in the pond in Caithness 100 years ago has rippled out across Scotland and created this whole movement that we now know as the SAYFC. And I, as you know, I, I don't know whether they get the credit they deserve for that. I think that's a story that needs to be told. And it's affected so many people. You know, you talk about movement in a pond rippled out, but we're not just talking about clubs formed, etc. We're talking about how many members have there been over the last hundred years. How many people have can can say, you know, hand on heart, young farmers was a great thing for me, and I now work for Bell Ingram, and it's you know it's been something that's boosted my confidence or taught me skills for life, etc. Mm. Yes, two very diff different ones with the vertical farming and the centenaries. It's almost looking back versus looking forward. So played the imaginary golden buzzer and chose pickups for pieces, just being bang, that's happening. But. I also didn't then show my cards, and I've, I think maybe I've done the right thing. Hopefully I've done the right thing. I've, I've listened to all that you guys have said, and um, 
you've all pitched this pod to me. You've all pitched your ideas of a pod. And I think I love the idea of the vertical farming. Completely see where Eleanor is coming from. Watch this space. I'm sure there could be a, a podcast that we might look at on that subject in the future sometime. But I suspect the most the most worthy winner of this because it's something that's close to, to, to all our hearts and I think it's something that should be celebrated and and Dave nailed it when he said that it doesn't get the recognition that it really deserves. I think we should be going down the route of supporting the SAYFC and making a podcast about their centenary. Yeah, I would go with that as well. As you say, they don't really get the recognition they deserve. We all sort of take them for granted a little bit. And this would be their chance to shine and really talk a little bit more about what they're planning for the future as well as looking back to the past. Yeah, there's where I think we're going. Eleanor, are you gonna are you gonna come in strongly and pitch about vertical farming or are we going with young farmers? No, look, young farmers, excellent cause. I'm continually impressed with the community spirit that that organization has. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Dave. We're on board. Oh, that's I'm so happy with that. Keith Ness YFC, we need to get in touch. We'll follow up. We'll find out when's best to come and spend a bit of time with you and do that recording. Um, and I, that's been a really interesting episode, isn't it? And apart from anything else, we've now got so many new connections with people that have got interesting things to talk about in the Scottish countryside. That's it's just felt really a worthwhile thing to do and. Huge thanks to Bell Ingram for giving us the opportunity to to you know base ourselves at your stand and uh, and have all these brilliant conversations. I've really enjoyed that. Can I can I say actually you know I hope that um, the people that we've featured in this episode, you know they've kind of had some recognition hopefully for what they do anyway. We might not be going to um, come and make a podcast at Stranraer Show for example, but Cara, you were a great ambassador for the show. We've hopefully given it a big plug. It's coming up, and I hope that as many people as listening as possible can go there. But just everyone, it's been great, and and, and massive thanks to Bell Ingram for, for the opportunity and the idea of um, hosting us on the stand at the Highland Show and allowing people to come up and talk to us and tell us their stories and, and, and pitch their podcast ideas to us. It's been brilliant. Absolutely, our pleasure. Thanks for coming along. Really enjoyed it. And if you are attending any of the shows over show season, we are at Kerrymuir in a couple of weeks and then Perth, Arran, Black Isle. So you'll see us. Yes. And then Come and say hello. You'll absolutely. be knackered. We will be absolutely knackered. <laughs> then it's Agri Scott in November, I think. And then we're going for a lie down. You guys have got a busy summer, to be fair. But we have got um, a, a kind of busier than normal summer coming up here on On Farm 2. Um, we have got um, some episodes coming out over July and August, which we often don't do. In previous years, we've taken more of a break in the school holidays. But this year, we've got some podcasts coming up that I hope you enjoy. We've got um, Pickups for Peace. I'm going to say that again. That's going to happen. We've got, Dave, I'm right in saying, we've got a look back at the Tug of War competition at the Highland Show. We've got a lot happening over the summer, actually, for, 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 for once. The other thing we're doing, which I'm really excited about, is we're going to go along to the Great Glen Challenge, aren't we? we the are. RSABI we fundraiser, are. the Great Glen Challenge. So We are. Yeah. I don't know whether we're yeah. having to... Are we having to take part? I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Um, so I've got... A, by the time this... Knee ends, injury. I've got a knee injury. Yeah, <laughs> knee injury. <laughs> I think the day after this episode is published, I've got a meeting to discuss um, whether what we actually doing at the Great have Glen to Challenge. take part in the Great Glen Challenge or whether um, we're just um, recording. Hopefully, you could take you could take part of Alison. She's our driver. Is that yes. right? Okay. Yes, well, we're I'll, taking part. Yeah, Alison, there you are. You've just volunteered to drive Dave and I around the course. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you can get in the back with the rest of the team, I'm not quite sure how the whole thing works. I think we have to tow a canoe as well. I think we need a minibus for this job. I'll sit, I'll yes. sit in the canoe. It's fine. Yes, you're more than so, welcome. So that's that's the that's the Bale Ingram team then. Yes. I don't think we're going to win it. That's the spirit. <laughs> that's, yeah. But on that note, yeah, we've got some great episodes coming up in July and August. There might not be one just every week, so if there isn't, 
do go back and and catch up on some episodes you might have missed because remember this episode we're so proud this is our 150th episode of on farm there's 150 episodes in the back catalog that you can go back through i would encourage anyone especially if this is your first time listening to us to do that because there's some fantastic episodes although i do say so myself well done guys yeah 150 that's awesome thank you thank you very much and listen it wouldn't be possible without Bell Ingram, Gillespie McAndrew, all of our sponsors. We, we're so grateful to you guys for supporting us. And thanks again for coming on board with this Pitcher Pod and taking part today. It's been brilliant. We also ought to thank everybody who pitched a pod, right? So all of those people yeah. that we heard from earlier in the episode. Of course, thanks to everybody as well who has... And we've, we've had some really, there's people that are, you know, have been with us from the very beginning who are still getting in touch on the social media. So thank you very, very much to everybody who's stuck with us now for 150 episodes of On Farm. And uh, with that, that's it from me and bye for now. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>